it's time for Mid-American Gardener. We're really glad that you joined us because we, the panel and I, really enjoy talking about plants, horticulture, and all things green and otherwise as well. So thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. My area is um, care of fresh flowers, cut flowers, and perennials, and I'm in the crop sciences department. But I also have three really intelligent-looking people next to me, <laughs> and so they let's may find. Be receptive, yeah. May, no, I think they really are intelligent, <laughs> but they look intelligent as well. <laughs> so let's find out who they are. They're going to tell you their expertise. So. As you're uh, watching, you know, we're going to gear the questions towards their area of expertise. Well, I'm going to start first with Dr. Tom Voigt. Hi, Tom. Good evening, Diane. Thanks for having me tonight. You're welcome. Uh, I'm Tom Voigt. I'm a faculty member of the Department of Crop Sciences on campus, and I work uh, primarily with perennial grasses, uh, turf grasses, ornamental grasses, uh, prairie grasses. So uh, if you've got a perennial grass problem, I'll try to, get, try to give you a hand with that. I've got a, uh, a question here, and it's entitled fertilization, but it's actually two questions. It's, the first part of it is, what's the best date to fertilize your lawn? And I, and I think a, a holiday fertilization schedule is, is uh, the way I would go. Um, How festive. I think uh, uh, fertilize in this part of the, uh, uh, in, in the Midwest here, we're growing mostly cool season grasses, and I think they're best fertilized on Mother's Day and Labor Day and then on Veterans Day. So we're looking at the early part of May, the early part of September, and the early part of November. If, your lawn, if you water your lawn in the summer, you could also add a, a uh, irrigate, uh, fertilization and, uh, uh, sometime between the middle of uh, uh, June or Flag Day all, all the way up to Ooh. the 4th of July. Oh, you're uh, good. So, so those would be my four fertilization <laughs> times. Uh, you really need three of those, the, the, the May, September, and, and November, to have a pretty decent quality lawn with water you can add to the, um, you can add that uh, summer uh, fertilization. But he's concerned about, the Gordon who wrote this uh, letter is concerned about, about uh, a lawn care contract because they want to apply fertilizer five times and they want to add a grub control. And uh, so I would uh, go back to your lawn care uh, operator and, and they are a service. And if you want to have your uh, lawn fertilized three times a year, then work out an arrangement with them. And if they're not, if that company isn't willing to work with you, uh, try to try to go to another company. Uh, generally, the companies will be putting down the uh, the, uh, the fertilizer at, at within a uh, general range of, of the appropriate times. So it seems reasonable. Yeah, have them work so, with but, you. But it's a, but it's a service, so so you should mm -hmm. you should try to get what you want from from right. the company providing the service. Now Tom has the best show and tell, Ooh. so he's gonna. <laughs> He's going to show us something. I just think it's such a great idea. So, last summer, as you, as many of you recall, we lost. Uh, I lost a lot of grass in my yard um, mm -hmm. uh, due to the uh, drought that we had all the way up until August. So a lot of the grass had uh, had given up the ghost uh, uh, prior to that. And when when I want to patch uh, bare bare spots in the yard, I uh, take a, a cue from the golf courses. Uh, and then uh, some of you golfers will notice that on on par three tees, you'll, there'll be a mixture of a, of a potting soil or a sphagnum peat moss and 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 grass grass seed. And after you make your divot, you're, they, uh, they're expecting you to f sprinkle a little of that material into the, into the divot so it can heal up and, uh, uh, for, for the future. So what I do when I have to um, take care of bare spots in the yard is I will rake that area to loosen up the soil a little bit. And I take my grass seed and I will mix, mix about, uh, oh, about a, a one part of grass seed to three or four parts of, of sphagnum peat moss. Now this is the material that comes in the bale. Uh, it's compressed. And so I will mix those together and stir those up. In this case, I would moisten it a little because it's so dry, it's going to be hard to, right. to, for it to absorb moisture out in, the, uh, out in the lawn. And then I would sprinkle that on the bare spot and then rake it, that, like, rake it again. Uh, and that way, the, the sphagnum peat moss holds moisture. It acts like a mulch for the seed. And then you can, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very easy way to distribute it. Now, I wouldn't want to do a whole lawn this way, but for, for bare spots in the yard, this makes a, a great way to uh, patch uh, those spots. And it's kind of your own uh, lawn patch material material that you, you might find in, uh, in the store. So it works very well. That is such a good idea. 
easy. And it is easy, and you know you don't have a lot usually, but you do want. Right. And, I, and I don't recommend Pyrex, by the way. Oh, I okay. see. Okay, we well, do use. I use a bucket at home. But some for of us, not, not lasagna pan. Uh. Some yeah. of us are interested in display, <laughs> and so, others of us want a so, five-gallon so bucket we do of use this. The bucket. So I was the one who gave him the clear Pyrex yeah. because I. And I appreciate <laughs> it because it, it was way better than trying to look at it a bucket. It really showed up good on camera. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I like that you said make sure you rake it first because some people pass and they don't have anything you, you've prepared. You've got to get the seed in contact with the yeah. soil. And so by mixing the seed and the sphagnum peat moss and the soil together, you're, you're, you're going to help that out, uh, is a winner. Uh, germination and help it, help it become established. Thank you, Tom, very much. We learned so much. All right, now let's go to our next panelist, and we're going to go to Kay Carnes. Hi there, Kay. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my areas of expertise are herbs, vegetables, and saving seed in the um, I'm particularly interested in heirloom varieties of, of all kinds of plants. And I have an um, email from a listener, a viewer, and she said that she's tried for several summers to grow nasturtiums and they, don't, they do well until the hot summer weather sur arrives. Is there a variety that is heat tolerant or do you have other suggestions? <clears throat> well, there's not really heat tolerant varieties of nasturtiums. But um, my suggestion would be to plant them somewhere where they're shaded during the afternoon, the, the hottest part of the day in the afternoon, and <clears throat> you know keep them well watered, but not over watered. And it might even be plants that you put it next to. Yes, I mean, it could be. Mm -hmm. Where it gets the east sun and something taller shades yeah. it. I love nasturtiums. I do too, and they they taste good. Have you ever eaten? Yes. They've got you a put, nice put them in your salad. The <laughs> yeah, they've got a nice peppery flavor. I just take the flower center, the flower parts uh -huh. out. Uh -huh. Those are well. The leaves are, are good too. But the flowers are good, mm -hmm. but just not the centers, and then yeah. the leaves. Well, let's take the center out and stuff them with cream cheese. Oh then. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or chicken salad. There or, or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's really really good. Okay, thank you so much, and those were such pretty pictures showing the, the nasturtiums. Well, now we're going to go next to Dr. Bob Skirvin. Hi there, Bob. Hello. So I'm, I'm glad to be here again. And so it, and my, my specialty is uh, fruit crops in particular, small fruits like blackberries and raspberries and blueberries and things like that, and grapes. Uh, but anyway, so but I'll be happy to talk to you about that, and we have some things to show you here. Uh, for, first, first of all, there's a, i got a question here. That uh, somebody came in. They say have a 50-foot long garage with a with a large open east east-facing wall. So what that means is they got east-facing. That means they got they have morning sun and then kind of in the shade in the afternoon in there. And they want to know what kind of fruit bushes would be good to, to put in there as they go. So what you have to think about is uh, all, all the plants like full sun. They, they'd be happiest in full sun. You know, we'd all like to go down to Hawaii or something. <laughs> but the, <laughs> But anyway, we can't do that. And so some, some of the plants will do, do pretty well. In fact, most of them will do pretty well. And we'll get a, the big yields, but you really can plant some blueberries. Uh, ones that for sure, uh, gooseberries and currants, we'll take that. And red raspberries, you can plant red raspberries along that side. And have plenty of red raspberries. In fact, they might even be sweeter. Mm. They'll get ni nice sun in the morning and you still get plenty. If you're in commercial production, you only get half as much as you would otherwise, but you'll still have all the raspberries you want. And so I, I, think, I think I would try that. So gooseberries and maybe some uh, red and black currants, some uh, raspberries. I think that probably the blueberries would too. They'd be all right. Not, not big yields because they like sunlight too, mm -hmm. but that would be okay. You can do that. And so okay. you'll have a nice fruit salad. Excellent. Now, did you bring a show and tell? <coughs> I did. I brought a fruit, I brought a fruit salad here. <laughs> anyway, so I, so I hope, hope it's holding up here. Uh, these, these are blackberries, and right now, I, I guess you've seen in the grocery stores, their blackberries are in the store, the raspberries in the store. It used to be we never saw these during the wintertime, because it's just a summer crop, but now they're there. And actually, this one's on sale. I won't say where, because we're not supposed to do that. But it was only a dollar for the package this, this week. And the, the, the blackberries that uh, came in are from Mexico. And down in Mexico, some, uh, some of the growers out in Mexico are taking some varieties, Marcus and also some of my varieties, some of the University of Illinois varieties, and uh, they grow them down there, and they take and spray them with a chemical that knocks off all the leaves, and then it, it puts the poor plant in shock, and then once the leaves are off, they come back and spray with some hormones, and the plant starts to flower again, and it'll flower for like five or six months, and they produce blackberries for five or six months, and that's what they're in the store, and these are really delicious. They are really, really good. The, the good news is they really are good. The bad news is in your, you'll be taking them out of your teeth 
for the next don't three do days. Don't do it, Bob. Don't do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but the thornless varieties. Well, they most, really taste good. Most of the thornless blackberry varieties, you've had a hand in it yeah. one time or another. Of yeah, your yeah we have some some of our patents. It's just a thornless and light and hardy and Dirks and thornless and some other smooth stem. Excellent. Anyway, well, so they're there, but these are really good. And so again, them, put them on your cereal. They're good, they're good eating. They're really nice, and, and they're available in the stores right now. So once you get your own blackberry bushes, then do what I did and uh, froze them on a tray mm -hmm. and individually. And so I've been pulling them out every day this week and having them on my cereal. So yeah, and be I didn't sure. Have to go to one, one of the things you said is really important when you do that. Whether you do raspberries or blueberries or whatever you do, you put them on a tray and freeze them, but they aren't touching each other. If you if they're touching each other, you'll end up with a big clump of <laughs> blackberries. A gallon of big, blackberries on your cereal. And it's hard to your cereal. It's not this individual. And you'll, you'll be chipping them apart. Six to eight, not a gallon. So. And once they're frozen, then you can take and pour them together, and they're mm -hmm. okay. And I don't That's even right. wash mine. I just I don't either. <clears throat> throw them on the because if you wash them, then they they, 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 they freeze really stick together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I try to you know it's nice if it's after a rain. Well, I, I, I sometimes tell my wife I wash them because she worries, <laughs> she worries about it, but I, I don't wash them. <laughs> I know that I don't put anything on mine. I know that they yeah I don't either. And, I, and we, we hope that no one else did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. I knew you were going to say that. I knew that was coming. Okay, okay well. Enough frivolity and fun <laughs> with horticulture. Let's go to the phone lines next. And we're going to go to line two. And this is a comment. Hi, line two. Uh, yes, uh, I was listening to your talk. Uh, last week? I can't hear you. No, go ahead and speak. We can hear you. Okay, well, last week you were talking about wrens. Yes. <clears throat> I have a lot that's uh, about 80 by 100. And I've wow. got five wren houses on each side of the house. The wrens are basically territorial, so you'll get a male on each side of the house, and they'll set up a housekeeping, and after they get through with the first batch, then they'll go to another house and have a second batch. And think how many insects, we were talking about how good a biological control the birds are so think how many insects they take care of and other critters well how interesting to have some on each side of your house that is really that is really fun so we'll, well the thing is uh, if you get a new rent house like this time of the year you may not get any rents because the house is new they I like have to, heard that they like to have have them go the house go through the winter once before they maybe will get in <laughs> That is a good comment because I have heard that and I've seen them not be used because of that. So. And it don't make any difference if, if it's an old house, it'll still get in. I believe that, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your comment because the more birds we can encourage, it's really good for the, for the garden. So very good comment. We appreciate it because we, we were chatting about birds of all kinds. Well, good for the garden last week. Okay, let's go on to line three and we're going to have a pruning Something about pruning. Hello there. Hello. Hi, what's uh, your question? We're, we're here. <laughs> my question is, when do I start pruning my peaches? Okay, in terms of uh, pe peach pruning, everything, uh, now is a perfect time to get out and prune before they, they start growing too much. I, ideally, it even would have been like, like three weeks ago, but it's perfect right now. It shouldn't be cold. Peaches are, are funny when you prune the peaches. If it gets really cold, they say if it's gonna, if it's gonna have a frost or something, the next day you can have a lot of damage. But since it really, it should be okay. You know, famous last words. But it, <laughs> it should be okay now you get out and prune your peaches. And when you prune the peaches, one of the things you want to do is peaches really really like sunlight and they need to be open. So you need to take out, make sure you really open up the branches. In commercial production, they take out the whole top of the tree. So it looks like a big vase is what it looks like in there to get a lot, lot of sunlight in the peaches. And, and remember also, especially at home, that they, when you produce peaches, they're really pretty heavy, and sometimes the tree, the tree isn't very strong, and they break apart, so you might want to, you know, later on the scene, you might want to put a little two by fours or four by twos or make crutches to hold up the branches for your peaches. But I hope you get peaches. I love fresh peaches, and it's mm -hmm. just, I always look forward to that, mm -hmm. and we have wonderful ones in Illinois those years they come through. We had, we had good ones last year. That sounds great. Yeah. Boy, that sounds good. Well, while we're waiting for phone lines, we want to go and test your horticultural knowledge. Yes, 
we're here to educate <laughs> and entertain. That's great. All right, let's go to line four next, and it's a question about roses. Hello there, line four. Hi, I'm in Springfield, and I have hybrid roses, and I need to know when to prune them and how far back to prune them. Okay, when and how to prune the hybrid roses. You know what? I think I would wait just a little bit longer. Um, a lot of times uh, later in April, is not too bad. Anyone else want to put their two cents in? But that's that's usually, it's like peaches. You don't want to prune too soon and then have a real cold snap. So um, prune it in April. Now it depends on what you want to do. If you want to shape it to height, you can pr prune a little bit farther back than where they die back because there will be some die back and you can prune right there. Prune to an outward bud so that it shapes them so they don't cross into each other. So prune thinking which bud is going to grow outward or where you want to direct it. And if you want to take a little bit off, you can go a little bit lower. Now, if you have a hybrid rose, but um, knockout roses, you can prune those even a little bit heavier because they're going to come back. So wait a little bit. Um, even though you get a nice few days, I would wait until you know more to the end of April. And then prune to shape and a little bit more if you want to decrease, decrease the height. Okay, thank you for your question about roses. And now we have on line five a question about vegetables, and it is Brussels sprouts. Hi there, line five. Yes, uh, my name's Ron. I'm from Watsik, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And last year I put in uh, eight Brussels sprout plants. Yes. And they grew wonderful. They did. They got like four and a half feet tall. The stalks were as big as your forearm, loaded with Brussels sprouts, but nothing got hard. There was nothing solid on the plant. When did and I wondered what I did wrong, or should I not plant them by something? Uh, at the end of the year, by November, we maybe got 15 Brussels sprouts off of eight plants. I'm going to ask one question, and then, Kay, you may want to. But and when did I had you... a friend tell me, as they grow, to strip the leaves off and only leave four or five leaves on the top of the plant. Okay, now, a question for you. When did you plant them? Pardon me? When did you plant them? I planted them about the second week in May. Okay, okay Kay is all over this question, <laughs> and I will be also. <laughs> Okay, Kay, go for it. Um, that a uh, uh, friend of mine Here comes did the, answer. the same way. <laughs> Here comes the answer, didn't do Ron. Anything till about October, uh, the end of October into November. Ron, here comes the answer. Take it away, Kay. Okay. Um, Brussels sprouts are a cold weather crop, and so okay. the best time to plant them is in the later summer. Mm -hmm. So that you harvest them after the uh, after the frost. Okay. Because the frost helps develop. The, the flavor of the Brussels sprout, they'll be sweeter. And the hardness. And you know, the hardness the... and, um, uh, you know, all that. So start them, oh, what, about maybe eight, August, end of August? Or, or, or maybe late July, but yeah. I would, at the very earliest, but probably August. Sometime in August, go ahead and put them in. Or, okay. Now, did you start from seed or did you use transplants? Uh, we, we started plants. Okay. You started plants, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead and, you know, um, get them in late and um, don't harvest until after the first frost or freeze. And then um, they and they should go, you know, they're really cold tolerant. Okay. Um, so and they better. should go. Yeah, they're a lot better. better um, okay. In the now, cold. you said something about after the first frost, and this person had told me to keep stripping the leaves off as they grow. Yeah. They said after the first frost, break the break the top off and they will come on then yeah i'm not Which, i don't didn't work i don't it, it didn't you need work. the photosynthesis of those yeah, leaves you're you gonna gotta get... have the leaves in order to, to, feed to the make plant. the sugar to keep the plant yeah. growing yeah. yeah okay so leave the leave the leaves on mm -hmm. now yeah. some of the lower leaves will die naturally Na naturally right take those off all right well it's the Brussels good, good, sprouts good, good luck. dilemma. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you, because most of them are available in the spring, and you I think know. you see them and you buy them. That's why. But they just sit mm. and don't taste as good. Yeah, they don't. If you don't plant them later. So, very good question. Thank you so much for that. All right, now we have a no-till gardening question on line six. Hi there. 
Hi. Uh, really enjoying tonight's show, and Bob's made me hungry for blackberries now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's his job. They're, they're, they're good. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to have to get some. My friend last year planted her very first vegetable garden, and she wanted to plant it as no-till. I believe she said she heard it on your program, uh, some of the things about it. All her vegetables that she planted were grown from organic seeds mm -hmm. and she's wanting to do it again this year and I myself have always tilled so I guess what I'm asking is uh, the, what are the benefits of milk or is, if how do you it? prefer one over the other. Well, tilling, if you till year after year after year that makes the soil really fine and then it doesn't absorb oxygen like it should. And so it's, it's really a good idea, um, if possible, to not till it or till it, um, you know, just maybe every couple years. Um, and just, if you get your soil, um, um, you know, use compost and use mulch, and that all goes back into the soil and makes it really friable. Um, you know, tilling's not really an issue. And also, when you till, you, tur you till up weed seeds. And so you're going to have, the more you till, the more weeds you're going to have. Um, so I, in my own garden, I, I don't till anymore, and I absolutely have to. Uh, I use, I dig uh, with a spade, or I've got a broad fork, and I don't know if people... Do you do a wide row, or do you do some of each, narrow or... Because I do wider row. rows. No, I do narrow rows Okay, mostly. so see, we both know till, mm -hmm. and we both have different ways of doing it. It's mm -hmm. just really personal preference. Mm -hmm. And it's but, really healthier for the but soil. But you guys are, are uh, long-time gardeners, and, right. and, and the first time you're working with a soil, right. you, the, the, the you're going to have to build unless, up that organic the first matter. Year, for, yes. Probably unless for you several layer. years, I would imagine, that yeah. you need to get, you need to, to that. Well, uh, I did till the first year for my vegetable mm -hmm. garden, mm -hmm. and then I laid out the paths, and those were covered, and then I, you know, staked out and laid out the wide rows for some, mm -hmm. and then um, basically I planted it, and then I have not tilled since yeah. then. Another and option is, is raised beds. You and know, mine you are raised beds. Reds, raised and, beds, you never have mm -hmm. to till them. So I planted onions the 20th of March mm -hmm. because it was raised, and they warm mm -hmm. up a little faster, a little bit drier. And I used a trowel and just, sometimes I just use my hands. It's really, the soil is really that good when you, after a while, build up that organic matter. Mm -hmm. So, but, and you don't, I mean, if you use compost and mulch, I don't really or fertilize. Yeah. Or <laughs> yeah. I do use a nitrifying, you know, powder for the peas and beans, mm -hmm. but, you know, otherwise I don't really fertilize because yeah. you're adding inorganic matter. Mm -hmm. So it gets better each year. Tell your friend that. It does get better each year and easier but I just it's just so easy not to till mm -hmm. <laughs> once you get started so yeah. okay now we're gonna go to a quick question about rose bushes on line two hi line two do you have a quick question yes I just bought two climbing roses and I wanted to plant them on a fence but there's a big walnut tree close by will that be a problem did you say walnut? Yeah. Yes, that'll be a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. How close is close by? Oh, probably 15, 20 feet or less. Oh, now that may, I don't know how, I know the, the drip line is a problem. Yeah. Is it a big oh, tree? It would be away from that. Okay. You may be okay then. Yeah, it, it might, it might reduce the, the growth some, but yeah, you're probably all right. Yeah, I was oh, thinking you're gonna say three to five feet. But oh, okay. No, I think you may, you may be okay. All right, now let's have you check this out. See what we have for you next.
Okay, now let's let's end the show with a show and tell. What about you, Kay? What have you got for us? Well, I brought a lemon verbena plant. It's an herb, and it's a very strong lemon scented herb. Um, everybody here, I think, has yeah, already oh, yeah, sniffed oh, it. I really and like it. It's it nice. for the evening. Uh, it's probably one of the strongest lemon scented uh, herbs um, that you can get. And it is a tender perennial here, so it will not survive frost. So you can do one of two things. Um, I actually just treat them as annuals, and I'll buy one in the spring, and after um, you know the danger of frost is passed, I'll plant in the garden. And they get quite get, uh, large in one season. Um, it'll have a woody um, stalk and stems, um, <clears throat> and they usually get between two to four feet in height. But it really is. It, it has a wonderful smells. smell. Oh, it? it's yeah. wonderful. So and it's good. great. Um, well, folks, I want to thank each of you for watching. See you next time. Have a great week gardening. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.